So this all began with a number of places in U.S. territorial waters where coral reefs were not just disappearing, we weren't seeing any kind of recruitment. And there was a gentleman by the name of Eugene Shin who would always tell the story that in Cancun, a hurricane would come through, wipe out the entire Elkhorn Reef, nothing there, just rubble. Ten years later, you couldn't tell there was a disturbance. It was thrown back. Um, that's not what we're seeing. Through the wider Caribbean and lots of places, um, through the Pacific, there's just no recruitment coming back. And why is that? In many of these places, we see coral diseases like skeletal tissue anomalies or what we commonly call coral tumors. Um, if you head over to like Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology and you swim on the north side, it's actually quite famous for finding coral tumors all over the place. Corals don't heal in many of these places, so if you can't create a lesion or a laceration on the coral, it should heal fairly quickly. Places in the Florida Keys, the Virgin Islands, Bermuda, Barbados, wherever there's lots of pollution, um, we don't see that healing. And then, of course, we don't see this coral recruitment. In Trunk Bay, the only thing that enters into Trunk Bay besides Kenny Chesney's uh, septic tank system are tourists. And for a while there, the National Park Service would allow 3,000 people on this beach at once. Not per day, but at once. Uh, and it was a local who kind of told us that go around 4 o'clock when the tourists all leave and it's a calm day, there's a sheen of oil on the surface of the water. And that kind of gave us the hint that maybe it might be sunscreens and other personal care products. What we found out is when we sampled there was sunscreen. This is oxybenzone, so it's the most common sunscreen ingredient used in commercial products. We found 1.4 parts per million uh, right near the beach. And over the, the Parides community assembly, we found 98 parts per billion. And this right now has been the highest level we've seen until we go to Hananama Bay and show you how high that can be. What are personal care products? Is there anything that you put in your mouth, on your body, anything on the epidermis, an organ? Um, there's, there was one estimate of close to 85,000 chemical ingredients that exist in commercial products today. I think less than 0.0001% of those have actually been thoroughly tested for toxicity. A number of examples for, of personal care products is like shaving cream, um, conditioners, shampoos, perfumes, deodorants, antiperspirants. If you're a toxicologist and you ever want to see something really scary, test an antiperspirant. Um, it blows things up. That's the aluminum. According to uh, the Environmental Working Group, women use 12 products uh, per day with 168 uh, different ingredients. Men use six products, 85, and children are usually exposed to three or four products on a daily basis, at least 61 ingredients that are on the label. My group and my colleagues, we were looking at a number of personal care products. We're not looking at all 85,000 of them. What we're focusing on are the ones that seem or might be the most toxic. And these include um, preservatives and antimicrobials, fragrances. Um, they're a lot more dangerous than you know. And then the UV stabilizers, the uh, UV chemicals. So sources and pathways. How do these personal care products get into the environment? There are two ways. One is swimmers and bathers going directly into freshwater or marine water um, uh, systems and it coming right off. The other way, and this is like 95% of how these personal care products get into the environment, is through wastewater. 
if you put a sunscreen, it doesn't matter if it's a lotion or an aerosol spray, and it has oxybenzone, you put it on your skin, 20 minutes later we can detect it in your urine. Most of the oxybenzone comes off in basically going down the toilet as urine unmetabolized. How much of these chemicals are actually going into our wastewater? This is just a, a, a small study that the Spanish did in Madrid. These numbers are parts per thousand. Um, and you can see from the UV filters, they're not so bad. Uh, lipid regulators, anti-inflammatories, um, illicit drugs like methamphetamine are pretty darn high. Do personal care products have an impact in the environment? There's two ways to investigate it. One way is forensically to actually show your, a, a, a specific coral reef is being impacted directly by personal care products. That's a forensic methodology. The other one is, for example, um, managers from marine protected areas, do they pose a risk or are they a threat? We don't know if they're actually having an impact, but if they pose enough of a threat, do we need to somehow manage them, regulate them, ban them? Um, both, meth both forms of, uh, of management require toxicology and environmental contamination. And we'll start with the toxicology. So this is what a coral looks like when exposed correctly to a, um, a commercial grade sunscreen, one of the top uh, five sunscreen products that are manufacturers. It bleaches corals. Our group is, is not the only group out there. In the last six months, there's been seven to eight other papers published on the effects of sunscreens on other reef biota. Uh, one of them is, for example, Xenia. It's a surrogate for, it's a Nigerian, and it's an easy surrogate for uh, coral. What that group found was that it prevented um, the Xenia from creating new polyps, so it prevented growth. And if you remember, what most of my colleagues who are coral reef ecologists see is a reduction in growth or extension rate of corals or a lack of healing. So this shows that under laboratory conditions that these products as a whole can stop Nigerian growth. Are they toxic? Do they start stop develop do they stop or, or inhibit development? Again, some of the top products and the diversity of these products, Blue Lizard is often uh, touted as um, they don't use oxybenzone. There's still some type of toxicity associated with them. So it's not just, when you look at the entire product, it's not just the UV sunscreens. It could be other ingredients in there that hold toxicity. Does it affect more than just coral? And <clears throat> coral rates are often, people who study coral rates are often dominated by fish biologists. And so what is, what is, how does these personal care products affect fish? Uh, the one on the far left is your carrier control. The uh, one next to it is supposed to be a reef safe sunscreen. And basically, out of all the individuals, it just they kind of blew the guts out of those fish. Um, the, this one right here is a non oxybenzone, avobenzone sunscreen. But notice the eyes. They should be silver, but they're yellow. The fish are blind. Somebody was using no tear uh, preservative. You ever heard of like Johnson and Johnson's no tear shampoo? It's no tears because it's a chemical that actually um, prevents the tear ducts, the nerves that, that, that uh, make the tear ducts produce tears from working. It's a neuro inhibitor. So oxybenzone, we know it's an endocrine disruptor. Uh, we know it's a developmental disruptor. In some cancer cells, some cancer lines, it actually causes the cancer to become more prolific. It affects behavior. So Taiwanese just published a paper showing that oxybenzone basically suppresses territorial behavior in, in beta fish. And we're trying to repeat the same study, but with dotty backs and um, cleaner ass. Is it an endocrine disruptor? So the, the Koreans actually discovered that in fish, 
there is a egg protein that should only be produced in females, sexually mature females, that are undergoing reproductive stimulation. If they're present in males or in juveniles, that individual is, is most likely exposed to an estrogenic endocrine disruptor. So our colleagues in France actually created this egg protein um, conjugated to a green fluorescent protein. So when it's expressed and under UV light, the organism will grow, glow green. And that's exactly what happens. So under controlled conditions, nothing glows. Benzophenone 1 is a massive estrogenic endocrine disruptor. Benzophenone 3, it is, but it's not as bad as benzophenone 1. What's terrible is that in most vertebrates, and we know also now in corals, is that benzophenone 3 is metabolized into benzophenone 1. <clears throat> what does it do to corals? Um, we published a study in October showing that it causes DNA damage and it induces bleaching. Um, it deforms uh, the coral planula. If you look at the concentrations, this is what's kind of important. It happens in the low parts per trillion levels. At what concentration does a chemical in the environment pose a threat to the natural resource? So if you look at, at the very conservative estimate, 200 parts per trillion is an action level for management saying, hey, you've got a problem with corals, and it's an acute problem. These studies, these exposures are eight-hour exposures. In the natural environment, most of these personal care products are called persist, pseudo-persistent pollutants. They're always there. <coughs> How much of these chemicals, chemicals are, in the, are, are in the environment? This is the Virgin Islands, St. Croix, Buck Island. Uh, the yellow is oxybenzone. The pink is methoxycinamate. This is a, probably the fourth most popular sunscreen chemical. It's being phased out, especially in the European Union, because it's a notorious endocrine disruptor, as well as causing acute toxicity in some organs. Where it says 56 parts per trillion is at 76 parts per trillion, this, these numbers here indicate the reproductive effort of these elkhorn coral, which are on the threatened species list, to produce egg and sperm. So at that location where we sample the water, there's almost no reproductive effort whatsoever. But it's way the heck out there what's going on. And what's going on is the tourism industry is bringing tourists to the spot. And you can see the sheen of oil coming directly from the scuba divers and snorkelers. And that's sunscreen. At least in the US, most of these chemicals are not looked at. So this is some of the first data showing a number of these sunscreen chemicals, octocrylene, PAVAs, camphors, methoxycinamates, avobenzone, what, how, how high are they in the environment? And these are all parts per trillion levels. So <clears throat> one's in four, uh, one section's in Florida, the other one's in the Virgin Islands. Oxybenzone, if you remember, our action level is around 200. We're all, Miami Beach, of course, there's no corals there. But Buck Island, uh, uh, Bahia Honda, and the Florida Keys, that's way over. You know, 10, 20 times over what the action levels are. How high are they in Oahu? During the summer, when uh, Waimea Bay is calm, there aren't any surfers out there, you, you get a lot of swimmers. And so we're seeing concentrations as high as almost 5,000 parts per trillion. Colina Cove, 568 parts per trillion. Waikiki, of course, is going to be really high. What are the concentrations in Maui? They're pretty much high all over except for Hana and what used to be our reference site, uh, La Perouse. It's no longer a reference site because tourism boats have come and contaminated the site three times a day. Honolulu Bay. It's a nature preserve. Kind of hard to be a nature preserve when you have concentrations of oxybenzone this high. Um, it used to be, it's just 
uh, people would park in Honolulu Bay, walk it in and snorkel, or you'd have surfers come in. But now what we see are a lot of tourist boats going out three to five times a day at the mooring buoys, and they all swim in there. And so you're increasing 300 to 600 more people per day going into this area. It's like Hananawa Bay. There, there's no live coral you know, in half the bay. There's no recruits in half the bay. And it's probably because the concentration of oxybenzone is so high. There's only three houses around this place, plus a row. So there's not much anthropogenic input. Sources of contamination. We always thought it was just people putting it on their bodies and getting in the water. Until somebody irritated me and sprayed aerosol sunscreen while I was sitting on the beach. And I got really mad. So we wanted to know how extensive is it? Five, six years ago, sunscreen companies had very directed nozzles. But because people don't know how to apply them correctly, they were seeing potential lawsuits because you get sunburns. And so the companies then increase the, the misting of, of their application products. And now you can spray the whole beach uh, with gallons of, of sunscreen. How far does a single bottle of like banana boat aerosol or Neutrogena aerosol, how far can it go on a beach? And I, you know, if you heard, heard my talk last uh, yesterday, I got hustled out of $200 because the lifeguards said he could smell and tell you exactly what product is being used at the guard station all the way down the beach. And we could smell it on that end. So that entire beach is covered. 450 meters, you've got contamination from a single spray can. We did this experiment by smell. The problem is, is that we have the assumption that fragrances are non-toxic, and that's not the case. So galaxolid is a synthetic musk. Do you like the smell of Tide laundry detergent? That's the smell. Um, it causes DNA damage both in human sperm, we tested it out in human sperm, as well as sea urchin sperm. So the beach contamination tidal flux, uh, is it a source of sunscreen pollution? And the idea is you're sitting next to somebody who's spraying themselves, it gets all over the beach. When do you sample for sunscreen levels, for example, at Kapalua Bay? And what we found out is, what, depending on what your question is, the tidal flux makes all the difference in the world of what concentration you're going to see. So we sampled uh, where the little yellow dot is for the water, then we sampled the sand where the kind of um, right there where the arrow's pointing. And what we found out is that when you spray, it gets all over the beach, the tide comes up, it liberates most of the sunscreen product chemicals that are in the sand, and it gets into the water column. So at low tide, as you can see, there's very, very little. High tide, four times above what the action level would be. The, the next question is, we talked about swimmers, we talked about people going in directly, but how much is it actually getting into wastewater um, and then coming out into the environment? And so um, INF means inf um, influence, so the waste going into a wastewater treatment plant and the effluent is what comes out of the wastewater treatment plant in the environment. And what you're seeing here are a number of sunscreen chemicals and preservatives that are coming, going into the wastewater treatment plant and then coming out. Fish that are swimming in the sea or in the streams, how much of these uh, sunscreens are found in tissue? So just imagine when you go and get your pokey or ahi, how much of these UV sunscreen chemicals are their preservatives? And um, what's uh, BP3 is oxybenzone. BP1 is the breakdown product of oxybenzone that is really estrogenic. Up until about here are your standard sunscreen UV chemicals. Over here are UV chemicals that are used in plastics. That UVP that's really high is actually a benzotriazole. 
It's a UV sunscreen chemical found in plastics in your clothing. Every time you do laundry and you've got a shirt like this, there's UV stabilizers to keep the color. Color fastness, you've heard that. It leaches out, goes, you know, goes from your laundry into the wastewater treatment system, and it goes right out into the environment. And so now you're eating this. Um, that data actually come, came from, from aquatic fish in Spain. We have data of fish that we can get at the market here in Honolulu or Maui, and they're even higher. The Spanish and the Brazilians have come up with some new data showing that do they occur in marine mammals? And so what they did was they found um, dolphins along the coast of Brazil. They sampled both mothers and fetus. And what they found was that both the mothers and the fetus were just chock full, had really high levels of, uh, of UV um, chemicals in blubber and muscle. So what about the humpback whales here in Hawaii? How much are they exposed to? The Canadians actually did something about this. They were finding levels of personal care products in sea otters and orcas. And so the city of Vancouver put in a, a modified tertiary phase treatment for the wastewater treatment system that would pull out 80 to 85 percent of these PCP chemicals in their fluid because they were concerned that the levels in those marine mammals were getting fairly high. So the Spanish actually went to nature reserves and, and took eggs and wanted to know how <coughs> high were some of these UV personal care product chemicals in birds' eggs. They're nowhere, you know, they're not at beaches. And so the take home message from this is that most, some of these personal care product chemicals biomagnify and bioaccumulate, which means it goes up the food chain. Anybody from UH or HIMB or Koala wants to look at sea turtle eggs, that's, I mean, where, where do sea turtles nest? And why do, you know, there are places in Florida where most of the hatchlings are female. And somebody who was supposed to work on this passed away recently who was famous for looking at sex feminization in reptiles. So it, it is an issue in Florida. And if everybody's spraying themselves on beaches in Florida, yeah, you can, you can imagine that it percolates through the sand and into the eggs. Humans, this hasn't even come out yet, it's in press. What's the level of these personal care products, both UV sunscreens and preservatives, in human placenta? And each one of those is an actual patient. So we don't know who the patient is. Patient number seven, I'm thinking that kid's going to turn out okay because mom didn't have anything at all. Patient number 12, oh boy. Um, the, uh, the purple where it says, uh, or, the, or the green, NPV, EPV, that stands for parabens. And you, you, you see products now that are paraben free. They're, all, they're still all over the place. The highest concentration of parabens. Um, parabens are bad because they're known endocrine disruptors. It's in breast milk. And the problem with this study is the same. Um, doing studies on humans is really hard because when you study that subject, when they know that they're being studied, their behavior changes. So often when you recruit um, women, uh, lactating women into these studies, you have to disclose what you're studying while you're doing what you're going to do with the sample. The first sample is great because it's highly contaminated. This is what this data shows. <laughs> but after you explain to them what you're doing, they get home. And once the husband comes in and starts feeding the baby and mom has enough rest, she begins to think, what the hell? What, what am I doing? What am I putting on myself? And so they noticed that after, because um, this is a repeated, they, a woman would come back every two to three weeks and, and provide sample, the concentrations would get lower and lower and lower. And when you would ask them, are you still using the same products as abundantly as you were? 
Like, no, we're going to Whole Foods and you know, not getting any of that stuff. So there is the problem with that, with that kind of stuff. Um, that's pretty much the science. And what you guys do now, after the science is presented, is I guess where Morella and Bob can take over um, and other stakeholders. So thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank you.